every morning, and I remember the cold mornings because we had more cold mornings, mornings than we had warm, warmth up there in New Jersey. We had a lot of snow, and I would walk down the avenue with my boots on, all bundled up, and lo and behold, each morning when it was clear, there was a star. And that star I faced every morning when I was going to get the bus. And I had a habit of saying a little prayer when I was going down the street and looking at the star because I was amazed by it. And I figured since I was still pretty young and had a lot of responsibilities with my sisters because I felt like I was one of the mothers, um, that maybe there was something for me, something different other than taking care of my sisters and going to school each day and then going to my job. And I would say, Lord, I know that you have something special in mind for me. And that was my sentence in each morning when I looked at that star. Whenever that star was there, I never failed to tell the Lord that I knew that he had something special for me. So I would get my bus each morning, get to work, and remember that Kay and Grace, my two friends from the South, and I, we were going to go to New York. New York wasn't far from Jersey City. We would just have to go into the Holland Tunnel, and there we are in some of the busiest sections of New York and Manhattan, Times Square. So that's where we went for entertainment and where I bought clothes, because in New York, you could find anything. Um, I decided since we were going to go out the night before Christmas Eve, which was December 23rd in 1944, that it was gonna be a special outfit night. So I went shopping for a new outfit. Well, I found a new outfit. And I thought my mother would die when she found out how much money I spent. But you see, Daddy was very generous with my wages from the store. So I saved up and I bought a dress. And lo and behold, never in this world would I have thought after spending 10, 12, maybe 15 the most for a dress. I spent in Macy's little shop, which was a special shop in Macy's, on a dress $39. And I thought, when Mom hears about that, she'll kill me. Uh, but she was very nice about it. She said, let this be your present to yourself. It'll be a long time before you get another one like that. <laughs> yeah. Because I didn't only get a dress. I got a little Persian lamb hat with a, um, it was an ice blue, they called it, feather in it, a little curly feather and a Persian land muff for my hands. I had some shoes. I never wore more than a Cuban heel. Did anybody ever hear Cuban heels? Yeah. And, um, and I had my princess style black coat. So I thought I was the cat's meow. <laughs> okay, so the, that day on the 23rd, I was kind of anxious. I wanted to show off my outfit, and we didn't make any real definite plans. We thought we would have a nice dinner out, go see some of the department stores had beautiful Christmas decorations every year. And if you, if you wanted to feel really like Christmas, you went to New York to see those decorations. So we were going to have our dinner, see some of the decorations, and then possibly see a show, or just walk around and just enjoy the Christmas feel of the whole thing. It was wonderful. And of course, it wasn't snowing, but there was snow on the ground. Um, well, I got home from work. Boy, I ran upstairs real quick, took a little bite to eat, got in my new outfit. And Mom said, yeah, I guess it was worth it. You look great. So I felt better. So I took the bus, because we didn't drive. We didn't drive anywhere. The bus was only a nickel. It took me all the way to New York. So can't beat that. Dad got rid of his car, 
when my sister Dolores fell out one time when she, he was driving. He got rid of the car. He said, now girls, we travel by bus. <laughs> so we did. And um, I got the bus to New York to the Hotel Pennsylvania. It was a, it's a lovely hotel with beautiful Christmas decorations inside. Well, Kay, she was the married one of the girls. She was in the lobby waiting for me. But her sister Grace was not there yet. And she said, I think we ought to give her a call and find out if she's at least left the house. So I got elected to call. So I went up to where the phone booths were. And um, as I got to the phone booths, against the wall, standing with one foot propped up on the wall, and a cap by the phone, and he had in his hands, he was jiggling a bunch of change. Well, when I looked in my purse, I knew I didn't have change. And it was a nickel for a phone call, but I had no change anyway. And he could see my dilemma, this handsome lieutenant. I thought he was very handsome. But then I had to say, watch out, Mary, you are engaged. I was engaged to a hometown boy, Frank. And, um, but anyway, I liked what I saw in Gage. <laughs> <laughs> my, my other friend, Kay, now Kay was the married one. Grace was engaged also. But anyway, he came over to me and said, do you need change? And I said, yes, I do. And he said, well, I can give you some nickels. So I gave him a dime and he gave me two nickels. And I thanked him. And uh, he said he was waiting there for a call to come through from New Orleans from his mother because he hadn't seen his mother and dad in a long time. He had just gotten into New York that night before. Um, he was in the Normandy invasion on Omaha Beach in Europe. Mm -hmm. And um, they had just gotten back, he and two of his friends, two other lieutenants. And. Uh, I made my call, found out Grace wasn't home, and I talked to him just a few minutes and found out that he was from the South and uh, told him that I was with two friends from the South. And uh, I gave him their names, and he said that he remembered someone in college being by that, who had that name. And lo and behold, he found out that Kay's brother-in-law had gone to the same school that he did, the University of Mississippi. And uh, I thought, wow, what a coincidence. That was a nice start. Anyway, we said goodbye, and I walked over to the girls, because Grace had already come while I was at the phone booth. And uh, I said, girls, I just met a nice lieutenant by the phone booth. And I said, he just got back from the Normandy invasion at Omaha Beach. And I said, you know what? We don't have any concrete plan. Why don't we ask him if he'd like maybe to have dinner with us and uh, maybe see a show? Or maybe he likes Christmas decorations. Who knows? But anyway, she looked. Kay looked at Grace, and Grace looked at her, and they both looked at me, and they said, well, I don't see any reason not to, and I had to laugh, because Kay said, well, I'm married, you're engaged, and Grace is engaged. So we know that this ought to be okay. So <laughs> we walked over to the phone booth, and he introduced himself. His name was Chuck Felder, and uh, he and Grace, uh, Kay got to speaking some about her brother-in-law in Alabama, and uh, we asked if they would like to join us. Two other lieutenants were going to join him in a little while, so they said, that'll be fine. Uh, he, he was happy to hear that. So when the two other lieutenants came, he asked, he said, these, little, these nice ladies asked us if we would like to have dinner with them or spend an evening we could uh, 
either go look at Christmas decorations, see a show, or dance, because they had the Cafe Rouge in the Hotel Pennsylvania. And um, everybody was thrilled to get together. So we, three lieutenants and three ladies, who thought they were perfectly safe because two were engaged and one was married. <laughs> but these were very nice gentlemen, thankful to say they were. And when I saw Chuck, I looked him over real well. First thing I noticed, his fingernails were clean. His ears were not sticking out like that. They were close against his head. I noticed ears. I did. And clean cut from the tip of his toes to the top of his head. And I liked him. I liked him. And anyway, we were just going to have an evening together. I think I still remember the story rather well. I might not need this. Uh, my memory's fine from way back. We went to the... <coughs> God bless you. Thank you. We went to the dining room there at the Cafe Rouge, and we had a lovely dinner. And one of the men said, would you like to have a drink? Well, I never drank, and I didn't have the slightest idea what to order. But I piped in, yes, that sounds good. <laughs> and I said, would you order for me? I asked Chuck. He said, certainly. He said, I'll have a uh, grand, old granddad, and what was it with old granddad? What did you have with it? Soda, probably, or water. Yeah. Well, anyway, he. I said, well, I'll have to say. <laughs> well, <laughs> it was horrible, needless to say. <laughs> but we had our dinner, and we took a vote on what we, everybody would like to do after dinner. And we decided we would like to go dance, because none of us had danced in a good while. So that was a nice thing they wanted to do. And they hadn't seen the hotel, all of the hotel or the Cafe Rouge, so they were all for that. And when we got to the Cafe Rouge, we heard singing in a band in the background. And I said, by golly, that sounds like Doris Day. And someone said, yes, it does. So we got in there, and there was Les Brown with Dallas Dar's Day singing Sentimental Journey. Wow. Yeah. Well, we danced. We had a lovely evening of dancing there at the Cafe Rouge. And when we sat down to take a break, we did ask if there was anything else they would like to do and what they would prefer. Would they still like to dance maybe at the Waldorf Astoria? And one of them piped up, and I think it was Chuck, that said, you know, I always wanted to see the Waldorf Astoria. I saw it in movies, so I think it was time. I'm right here. Why not go to the Waldorf? Mm -hmm. So uh, everybody said, that sounds great. So uh, we went to the Waldorf Astoria. And there was a good band there, too, but it wasn't like Les Brown and Doris Day. But we danced some more. Now, I was 19 years old at the time. I'd had a curfew. And I knew my dad meant business when he planned that per a curfew. And I had to be home at 1130. So I told Chuck that I was sorry to break up the party, but... I had to go home, and Chuck, I said, Chuck, you just go ahead with, with Kay and Grace and your friends, and just keep dancing if you like that, or whatever. And I didn't like the idea of leaving him with Kay and Grace because <laughs> he was dancing with them too. And you know what? For some reason, I wasn't too happy about it because I wanted him to dance with me. But luckily, he did dance more with me when we were at the Waldorf. But he said, uh, no, Mary, I'm going to take you home. We'll get a cab, and I'll take you home. 
and uh, I'll be back and see the boys later because we knew they weren't going to go too far. They were going to be right around where we left them. And uh, we took a cab and went to my house. And he walked me up the stairs and to the door. And he said, you know what? I'm not leaving tomorrow. And I said, well, your mom and dad are expecting you tomorrow. He said, I know they are, and I'm going to call them. And I said, well, why aren't you leaving tomorrow? I want to get to know you better. I was hoping maybe that was the reason, and it was. He said he wanted to get to know me better. He said, could you see me tomorrow night? I said, unfortunately, my mom and dad are going out with my uncle George and my aunt Marianne for the evening. It was Christmas Eve. And I said, I've got to babysit, so I don't think we could make it tomorrow. He said, well, let's play it by ear. We'll... We'll see what happens by tomorrow. But I'm not leaving. I just want you to know that I will still be here at the Hotel Pennsylvania, because that's where the Navy men went. They boarded them there. And uh, he must have called his mother and dad that night. The next day was Christmas morning, and I woke up. I can remember I woke up in tears. I was sobbing even. And my mother came into the bedroom and she said, what's wrong? I said, nothing. She said, is Frank coming home or is he home or do you miss Frank? Something's making you cry. I said, no, but I have to do something today. Mom, first I have to make a phone call and then I've got to deliver Frank's parents presents for Christmas and uh, she said well I have something to tell you she said we can't go out tonight because Aunt Mary Ann and Uncle George can't make it tonight so we're going to make it another night and I said well mom can I go out tonight she said we'll talk to your father so we did and he said okay Mary and I thought that was fabulous because daddy doesn't usually let us go out two nights in a row like that and till 11.30 especially, because that was our curfew, my curfew. Anyway, I was the eldest. And uh, I got dressed, said goodbye to the family, walked to the bus, took the bus to Frank's parents' house, delivered their presents, and Frank's parents gave me a gift from them. It was the loveliest blue negligee you had ever seen, and that just floored me. This was not the time to give me a blue <laughs> negligee <laughs> from his parents. It just wasn't, it didn't set too right with me. So I took the bus to the Hotel Pennsylvania, and he took me into the lobby, and we sat there and talked and talked and talked. He told me all he could about himself. I told him all I could about myself. And when it got to be pretty close to early morning, I didn't even think about 11.30. I didn't think about 11.30 at 1 o'clock. I didn't at 2 o'clock, but at 3 o'clock. I just knew I wasn't just dreaming. I was going to really get killed. I was. <laughs> we took a cab. He took me to my door again. He said, Mary, something's happened to us, hadn't it? And I said, Chuck, something has happened to us. He said, what are we going to do? And he said, you're engaged. He said, do you love Frank? said, I thought I was in love with Frank, but now I'm not sure. Maybe I was just in love with love, and he always cared about me, and I didn't want to break his heart because he always made me the best ice cream sundae as you can <laughs> <laughs> He called it a bridge. Three big lumps of ice cream, crack, uh, 
sugar wafers across the top, and then everything that goes conglomeration on top of it. And he used to just like to watch me eat it because I'd eat the whole thing, almost the bowl. It was always so good. And I, I had a lot of fond memories of Frank, and he was a photographer in China at the time because it was in, after the end of a Chinese, a Japanese, I guess it was their war, and he was there photographing for the army. Uh, Chuck said, Mary, I guess the only thing we could do is say this, if the Lord meant for us to be together, we will get together. He said, in the meantime, I will write you. Will you write me? And I said, yes, I will. I'll write you. And we said goodbye. And he kissed me goodbye. Well, when he kissed me, I almost fell on the floor. He had to grab me. I really never felt that way before. And I said, what in the world is wrong with me? What about Frank? And I said, well, Chuck, I will write you. And we said goodbye. Well, the next morning, I forgot to even tell Chuck. Well, I didn't know, so I couldn't have told him then. But in the morning, it was storming. Then in 1944, the planes didn't take off in storms. And I realized that. And I got to the phone as fast as I could. And all I heard was Lieutenant Felder. And I said, Chuck? And he said, Mary? He said, get down here as fast as you can, even if you have to take a plane. And I knew I wouldn't be able to get down there fast enough, but I did. I got to the Hotel Pennsylvania lobby. He was standing by the door. This was Christmas Day. And he looked at me, and I looked at him, and he said, Mary, would you marry me? And I said, yes, Chuck, I will. Hmm. Now, I don't know whether to go beyond that or not because I want you to buy a book. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good place to stop. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great sales Smart pitch. Marketing. <laughs>